Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Battle of Alberta is in full swing. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to recap it. And Matt, why don't we uh, start this series at the beginning with game one? Yeah, um, a bit of an interesting start to this series. When I was excited, I mean, we're going into this Battle of Alberta, the game's at home. I know you were there, and by halfway through the second period, Calgary's up 5-1, to one, and you're going, wow, we've got this. Somehow, the game ended up being 9-6 to six in the final score. Like, you should probably, when you get 5-1, win the game. You should also win a game when you score six goals. We shouldn't have to get nine goals to put the Oilers away. Yeah, this game... Well, this whole week of games is just a a testament to the Flames' hubris. And because it came so easily for them in the first 40 minutes or 30 minutes of the game in game one, where like they basically were just imposing their will and scoring at will on the Oilers, it's like they got it in their head that that's all they needed to do. And, you know, like, oh, we don't need to try anywhere near as hard as we did with Dallas. The Oilers are bad. And so they got careless, and then they found themselves tied at six, like two minutes into the third period. And it's like, um, guys, what are you doing? And I think it was probably, a, sort of like you were saying, sort of an interesting change for them after, you know, series that were one or two game series against Dallas to come out with that kind of firepower. Yeah, and like the main difference between the Oilers and Dallas is it you're basically playing opposites. Um, Dallas had no offensive talent whatsoever, and Edmonton has a good bunch of firepower. Edmonton doesn't really have defense or goaltending at the same level uh, that the Stars did. So you have to be able to play in different ways. And because of how easily the the goals came in the first 30 minutes, it's like it, it got into their head that, oh, well, we don't even need to try hard in order to score. And from like the 30 minute mark on when they got up six to two forward through the following games, the team just seemed to be in their own way instead of, you know, just doing the simple things that got them there in the first place. Looking at the other games, but Oh, I know. I'm just, it, it, how would you say it was the start of the trend started in game one and moved forward. Can you remember the last time you saw a goalie pulled that quickly? I mean, Smith was pulled, what, seven minutes into this game? Yeah, like it was not a good start for Mike Smith, but it wasn't a good start for the entire Edmonton Oilers. Mike and, Smith played 6.05. And it's hard to blame Mike Smith. Like, the Flames really were basically treating him like Jake Ottinger and doing all the things that they had to do against the Dallas Stars in order to win. And... You know, the the Oilers were not anywhere near as good defensively as the Stars were. So, it, of course, it was working. And, you know, you went from facing a goalie god to an actual human being. And they were able to score three goals in six minutes. Yep. And, uh, obviously, the Flames took the early lead. Then we move on to Game 2. Game 2 also here in the Sal Dome. I ha- had the pleasure of being there in the stands for this game. Matt was a Game 1. And... I can tell you that after the Michael Stone goal in Game 2, I've never heard that building louder. Like, you can tell how important this is to the fans here. Yeah, and again, um, with them getting in their own way, like, when the Flames scored the 3-1 goal, Tyler Toffoli getting it on the power play, again, they were in control. Uh, When you're up 3-1, you should be able to pretty much manage the game from that point forward. And instead... Darnell Nurse accidentally high sticks to Foley, and Matthew Kachuk selfishly goes and interferes with Nurse and punches him, taking a dumb penalty. And that selfishness is what cost the Flames in this game. Because immediately the Oilers scored two on the four-on-four, one was waved off, gave the Oilers all the momentum, and they carried it all the way through to a 5-3 victory. 
Yeah, I mean, 22 penalty minutes per team here. That's uh, way too many. Yeah, for sure. And, like, Calgary uh, and a lot of the younger players like Matthew Kachuk need to learn situational awareness. And, like, yeah, it was a piss off that Nurse high sticked. To fully, uh, you know, and I would be angry if I was on the ice and saw that myself. But at that point, you just got to skate away and let the guy take the penalty. But you know what you do is you let the guy skate to the penalty box, and then you go make it four to one. Instead, you're just doing a very selfish thing, taking yourself out of the play, taking all the momentum out of the play, giving it to the Oilers, and there you go. Yeah, no, you're right. There was far too many penalties, and... Far too much retaliation. We know that generally the guy who retaliates is the the guy who you know goes to the penalty box. Yep, and it, it just completely selfish play from like that point forward in the game, and just a lack of awareness generally. Like well, it, I hate to it, say it, but when you've got Coleman and Monjapani each getting four penalty minutes, I mean those are guys we need to be helping us offensively, and when they're out. That's that's really hindering your team. Yeah, and you look at like when the Flames got that power play in the third period that led to the Oilers' game-winning goal. Like, I, I, yeah, Anderson pinched down low, but there was no situational awareness by any of the other Flames players that, oh, hey, you're going to allow a breakaway if he turns that over. The only Flames forwards without penalties in this one, kind of interesting list. Yeah. Michael Backlund, Milan Lucic, Trevor Lewis, Brett Ritchie, and Callie Yarncroak, the only forwards without penalties. Yeah, and like it was just not a smart effort by the Flames in this one. And no, it wasn't. And like you said, when they were up three one, I thought, wow, the Flames have you know the Flames should get this, tighten it up, start you know playing a defensive game. You you should be you should be able to take this one home. Yeah, and like that's where like me mentioning hubris, like you know. It's just like when we had our conversation during the, this point last series, we were talking about respecting the Dallas Stars too much and not getting in the goalie's face and doing, you know, and treating them differently than they should. And this, it's the exact opposite. It's treating the Oilers as if they're like the Seattle Kraken and just expecting to walk over them. Well, you know, the Oilers, yeah, they have a lot of flaws, and you should be able to beat them. But, you know, there's a reason why they had 104 points this season. They're also really dangerous if you're being stupid. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go as far as saying that it's treating them like the Kraken, but I think the Flames just got too emotionally invested in this game and started, like you said, taking dumb penalties and retaliating, and they need to just learn to skate away. Well, by that, I'm meaning like playing down to the level of like how the Flames at times during this season have played down to the level of their opponents and, you know, like taking it way too casually and not focusing on any of the things that they need to do. It, like this team can bite you if you're not paying attention and yet they're just doing way too many casual and frankly stupid plays defensively that are allowing the other team just to walk all over them and biting us is what they did when we get to game three the series shifted back to edmonton and i don't think this went the way that any of us expected in uh the first period pretty even game obviously zero zero coming out of the first fourth second period the Oilers scored four goals and evander kane hat trick and zach hyman got a goal to make this a 4-1 final I would say the big issue here for the Flames, again, penalty minutes. 27 Flames penalty minutes to 16 Oilers penalty minutes. I mean, this is, again, you're you're getting the guys who are not on the ice with their line mates. You're playing four, you know, four on five. We even saw some four on three. The key to beating these guys is to stay out of the box, and the Flames didn't do that here. Well, not only that, um, but just, like, on the goals that they surrendered, you know, like, you can't play McDavid man on man and expect good things. And, you know, yet like throughout this series, they're playing them very tightly, which that it's just like how the flames used to go up against the Sedin twins. And like, if they got in their face, 
that's when the bad things would happen because they would be able to beat the player that was getting out of position to cover them. And, you know, like, instead, like, they're just doing all these things to get themselves out of position, which allowed so many odd man rush g goals against that, you know, like, I don't blame Markstrom for any of the goals against. No. Because, like, you could have Vasilevsky or Ottinger, and, you know, like, they would have scored on three or four of those. And, you know, like, it was just completely imbecilic defense by the team entirely uh, as a five-man unit for that entire stretch. The Flames did not look good in that game. And as the Oilers, and this reminded me of Flames teams of the past where, you know, as the Oilers started to mount their comeback, we saw the Flames starting to just fold. And, you know, it, it reminds me of the, the team from two, three years ago where, you know, when the when the going got tough, the Flames just it, left. Like, that game, literally, like, right from the opening puck drop, I thought I was watching the Colorado series again. And it's like, um, what? You know, like, the Oilers are not that good. Where, like, they should be steamrolling you like the Avalanche did to the Flames a couple of years ago. Like, it, it's just absolutely ridiculous that this is happening in this period and in, in this game like it like it's it's frustrating to see because like once they got to the third period they played exactly the game that they did for most of the first 30 minutes against the Oilers in game one which was just playing their simple game like this team is so contradictory that they have all of the tools that they need to be successful but they don't have any ability within themselves to show any consistency and like you look at teams like say Tampa Bay who's not as good as they have been in the past couple of years when they won the Stanley Cup it, you know like yeah Florida today was coming out at them to try and stave off elimination but they were patient and then they just played their game and they ended up sweeping the Panthers and, like, the good teams, like, they find a way to manage when the other team is doing good things and then turn the tide when the time matters. And, like, this team seems like if they get too much success, it goes to their head. It blows up that, oh, we don't have to try because we're having success. And then they fall apart, and then they have to dig it out of themselves just to get back to some semblance of constancy with their play and it's just the lack of mental maturity from this team is astounding and, and you know even the coaches i mean today kurt muller talked about it an immature or not an immature but a young team right guys that are not you know don't know playoff hockey haven't been there so i wouldn't say it's an excuse but the flames have to bounce back and it's only and you and i had this discussion this time last round it's only two to one. The Flames are only down by one. I'm not that worried, even though the Oilers have two wins in a row. But if the Oilers take game four, they're then done. I'm worried. Yeah, they're done. Three one against the Oilers is going to be a very tough comeback. It, it, put it this way, if the a non playoff team was up three one on the Flames, I would be, yeah, no. <laughs> so I think that the Flames need to find a way to, and and you mentioned it at the end of game three, we saw in that third period. The Flames getting back to what they needed to do. And I think the big question for me is, will that continue into Game 4? Will they be able to go back and play the way they did in Game 1? And I'd say maybe the first part of Game 2. And, you know, go back to what they need to do to be successful. Yeah, it, it seems like this team, whenever they get too much success, it's like they tune out the coaching staff a bit. And we like we saw that towards the end of the season... Uh, when everybody was chasing, like, the 100 points in the season for Gaudreau and Kachuk and, like, any other milestones, like, 40 goals, like, they got away from how they should play because it's like, oh, well, I'm too good for... And then bad things happen, and, oh, crap. You know, we've all of a sudden lost a few games, and, you know, like, the Flames are behind the eight ball now, and it's going to be a six- or seven-game series if they want to win it, and... You know, like, they don't have anybody but themselves to blame for treating the Oilers way too casually. 
Yeah, and I think the Oilers have been, I would say in this series, the Oilers have been a better team, and I don't think we have seen the Flames really play their game. Like They're capable of so much better. We haven't seen them at their best for any consistent stretch. I'd say more than 20 minutes in this series. No, like outside of the first 30 minutes of the game one, like the Flames have played their worst se- hockey of the season in these two and a half games. Like it, it's just been an embarrassment, frankly, for the level of play. And, you know, as much as like a lot of fans are harping on Jacob Markstrom, like, you know, if you're giving up that many scoring chances and odd man rushes to like the best players in the NHL you know, they're going to score on you on occasion. Like, you know, like there's only so much that he can do. And yeah, the Flames have given up 15 goals. And it's because the Flames forwards and defense have been absolutely horrendous. Yeah, I don't think we can pin many of these goals on Jacob Markstrom. I think that Markstrom's been, has ended up being our last line of defense because, you know, like you said, the defense just hasn't been what it needs to be. The, especially that top pair needs to be better of Anderson and Hannafin. Yeah, like it, f- really from a man from top to bottom, like there's nobody in this series that I'm really satisfied with how they've played. Like they've all been bad. And, you know, this might sound weird to say this, but I thought of in the three games, I thought that Markstrom actually looked better in game three than he did in game two. Yep. I thought he, his best game was game three. I think so. Um, moving away from talking about the, these games and move. Well, actually, let's talk about one more thing in game three before we move away. What do you think of the Lucci chin on Mike Smith? A lot of people thought it was a dirty hit. A lot of people upset about it. To me, when I watch it, it looks like Luch is putting his hand out. It looked to me like he's trying to stop. He can't stop. So he's putting his hand out, trying to brace himself. I don't want to. I don't know what's in anyone's mind. I'm wondering if there might have been a little bit of uh, dive by Smith as well. But it's to me, it's not as bad a hit as people are making it seem like. Well, it, as Daryl said after the game, like, could you imagine if it was charging? You know, like if Lucic literally had run the goalie properly, like Mike Smith would be still getting scraped off the glass. You know, yeah. like he, yeah, like that was a very light hit. And yeah, he did collide with them, but like really that should have been a two minute minor and a 10 minute misconduct, not, you know, five in a game. Like that was way overkill by the referees. I agree. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think it was overkill. I mean, I think it was overkill, but I also understand why they did it in a way. Like, I Oh, think I agree. That it, you know, you, it you game management to... and all that, and you didn't want everything getting out of hand. But, yeah, and you had you had to set precedence that this isn't going to be allowed. Yeah, but uh, for like that in isolation, like if it had been like say a defenseman instead of Mike Smith, that's not even a penalty. That's just finishing your check. Like, it, it, to me, like I don't see like it, it, if it was anybody other than the goalie, I don't even think it's a penalty. But you know, it, they have to make sure. That, you know, like things didn't get out of hand or like one of the Oilers run Markstrom or Vladar or whatever, or, you know, like they don't need things getting out of hand in that way. But, you know, it, for it being a dirty hit, it would have been a dirty hit if he actually crunched them. Then, yeah, that would have been a five minute major and a suspension and all that. Yeah, I agree. But I think. And you can even I, I, see that, like, there was no supplementary discipline, it, that in and of itself, you know. Like which it, tells you that, if the, yeah, if the league's not too worried about it, we probably shouldn't be either. Yeah, like, uh, that's, because they're very suspension happy when anything like that happens. So if they're like, yeah, that's good, then, and yeah. I, I, and I think it's, you know, it needs to be said that to understand the whole story, yes, Mike Smith left the game. It was due to concussion protocol. They had no choice. Yeah. He had to, by league rules, leave the game and get checked out. He came back. Good. He's he's good again. I think that, you know, this is much ado about nothing. I, I definitely think that some of those emotions will play into game four. And if the Flames use them correctly, they might be able to have the Oilers take a couple extra penalties. Um, but I think that, yeah, I, I think this is much ado over nothing. Yep. So, Matt, you've talked a little bit about it, but how does this series feel different from you at the 2-1 point than it did the series with Dallas? For Dallas, I thought that the Flames were basically 
treating Ottinger as if he was just an NHL goaltender. And, you know, he was stopping everything that the Flames were shooting at him. And, like, that's where, like, I had mentioned that the Flames needed to stop respecting him and, like, get in his face and, you know, screen him and all those kinds of things. And to me, it's, like, the exact opposite. The Flames, because of the early success in Game 1, they got it in their heads that, oh, this team is garbage, so therefore we don't need to play hard to beat them. And, like, we can coast through this playoff series. And then they realize that, hey, the Oilers can actually beat you if you're being stupid. And, you know, like, it feels like the Flames are have completely let this go. Whereas, like, it, in the first series, like, it just didn't feel like the Flames had enough intensity in following through with their scoring chances and, like, weren't like getting in on the second opportunities this one it just feels like they're just letting the opportunity slip right through their fingers because oh we don't need to try too hard it felt like for the first three games of the last series calgary was for the most part the better of the two teams yeah i agree um and it didn't feel like that i don't think in in this game um or in this series i should say it doesn't it doesn't feel like um, like they've been the better game or the better team in the first three games. I would say, no. Like when they got up six to two in the first game, uh, then till it was tied, and then from uh, the three one goal forward, like the Flames in that stretch and in the subsequent like after they're up three one, like they just stopped playing hockey entirely and. You know, the Oilers, like, if you let them walk in, they can score on you. And the the Flames just were not paying attention to details, not following through on any of the small things that they need to do to be successful. And engaging too much man-to-man -man with McDavid. And that really is, I think, the main reason why... Uh, McDavid has so many points in this series because, like, if you remember, like, a lot of other teams that had success against the Sedin twins was that they would allow him to them to both skate around and pass the puck and, like, just get their sticks in the way and let them kind of burn themselves out. McDavid is very much that same type of guy where if you're in on him, he will beat you. But if you just let him skate around and skate around and looking for seams to pass it to Drysaddle or whomever the third guy on the line is, and if you can get your six in the way, you can actually turn the puck over and go the other way. And yet the Flames are engaging too much with everybody and it's giving too much time and space. What I was seeing too much in Game 7 to my liking was two or three guys trying to cover McDavid. And then he, you leave somebody else open. He just fire the puck across the ice, and you'd have Drysital or someone else there to just pop it in the net because they weren't covered. Yeah, well, that's exactly how Kane got his hat trick. You know, like just it, it completely horrendous defense. Like it, just not you know like AHL quality in that game. I guess there's for me the biggest difference between the series is well two of them. We know that both teams can score in this one, and we're getting a high-scoring series, which I think in some ways the Flames may have been frustrated last round when they weren't getting all the goals that they wanted to, but they were also doing a lot better offensively. I think that, like I said, you know, Calgary was the better team in the first three in that series, but hasn't been in this one. And I would say that the top line hasn't really shown up in this series yet. No, and like how would you say? It's like what Markstrom was saying about Ottinger was that like he had to be better than him and you know with how good Ottinger was like he had to make sure that he wasn't allowing more than what he did and you know like the the rest of the team like they stepped up as well uh, because like they had to try and beat him and get creative to get pucks past them and you know like they all elevated their games because you know they wanted to win and were taking all of those extra steps that they needed to in order to win. And then they had so much success so quickly against the Oilers that it's like it 
broke their mind that like, oh, we don't have to try. And like the whole team is completely out of rhythm and like it, it's not that hard. Like the Oilers are not very good. Like the Kings pushed them to seven games. Like they you know, and LA could have easily won that series. Like this team isn't very good, but you have to still follow through and do your homework. And none of these players have been doing their homework this week. I think another thing that has to be pointed out is missing Chris Tanev. And I think Tanev really would have been important in this one um, to to help neutralize McDavid. And he's been such a an important defender for the Flames. And they really don't. And I think this is maybe showing some of the lack of depth on the blue line. Yeah, Michael Stone's been great, but he's not. And I don't think anybody could fill in for Tanev and what he brings here. So it's, to me, it's really been a, it's been definitely noticeable that Tanev's out. And, and I would say the best defensive defenseman who you need to cover McDavid has been absent. Yeah, and hopefully he's better pronto and doesn't miss any more games, but... It sounds like he's been skating. Yeah, which that helps, but it's one of those that, like, who knows what the extent of his injury is, and it's, you know, it's just sort of like uh, a few years ago when uh, Giordano hurt himself at the trade deadline and they had him do the pregame skate, even though, like, he had torn his bicep. So it's like, uh, yeah... Um, uh, who knows what, and I whether th- I Tanev's like too, out, out or not. He's he's quite the Iron Man. I mean, if he's out, it's something wrong, and I don't know that he'll be able to be back in just a few days if it's the, you know if it's that bad. Yeah, we'll see. Um, you know, and I think you know, and I'm trying to figure this out, Matt. Maybe you can help me to decipher it. Is our defense looking bad, or is McDavid just making them look like chumps. Well, uh, and like this is what I was uh, meaning with uh, like getting a little too in on McDavid because like he will literally beat any defenseman one on one in the NHL. Like there is not a guy that can single handedly can contain McDavid, and that that's why like I was saying like the Flames' whole defensive philosophy around him is like playing right into McDavid's wheelhouse and you have to let him be able to skate as stupid as that sounds and backwards as that sounds, you know, and you just have to make sure that your sticks are in the way and using good defensive positioning. So that way he's skating around and around and around trying to probe the defense, but not actually giving him any space to fire pucks through. Or if you, they, he does make those passes, that sticks are in the way to tip the puck away from and interfere with whomever is the recipient. And instead, they're forcing him to go one-on-one, which it's like, oh, okay, thank you. I will just go beat you now. And, you know, how many ever points? 10, 12 points already in this series? And it's like... You're not doing very good, Calgary. Like, it, and it, it's not the defenseman's fault. Like, the defense has actually played everybody else really well. It's just that, you know, you can't get too in McDavid's face. He, he's just simply too good for one-on-one play. You have to kind of zone him out. And Edmonton's taking pretty much any key mistake that the Flames defense make and is leading to a goal. Yeah. So you've you've just got to stop making some of those mistakes. I mean, Calgary's top pair, uh, Anderson and Hannafin, it looks like here, are minus four combined in the series and minus six over the last two games. So they, they've got to get better. And I know it's hard. I mean, McDavid's a hard guy to defend. I wouldn't want to defend him. But they were one of the best pairs in the regular season. And I think, you know, it's not just them. This entire team needs to get back to playing their top game. If we get that top line scoring, if we get our, you know, our players playing defensively the way we need them to, the way they did during the season, I think Calgary can take this. Yep. I think there's two ways to look at this. There's, you know, the glass half empty version, which is it's two to one. Calgary obviously isn't good. Edmonton's going to end up winning this. And then there's the glass half full version, I would say, which is, you know what? Calgary's only down by one. They can be better. Um, They haven't brought anywhere near their best so far, but we know they're capable of it. And if they can show that, they'll take this. 
Well, and this will this whole series will men- hinge on the Flames' mental fortitude. Like they're clearly the better team. If you're just looking top to bottom in each organization, the Flames are the better team. But they need to have the mental discipline to actually play like they're the better team and play with consistency and and stay out of the damn box. Oh yeah, like just. And that's part of, like, be, just being selfish. Like, yeah, the Oilers are the rival, but who cares? Like, treat them as if you're playing the Ottawa Senators. Like, who cares? Like, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, the who's in the other jerseys doesn't matter. Like, your goal is to get four wins. Like, it's not, you know, like, if you're taking stupid penalties just because you're trying to get tough with the Oilers, well, you're just giving them the series. Like, you know, you're literally just beating yourself. You're not doing anything to help the team. You know, and as much as, yes, I mean, and I've talked to a lot of people, yes, McDavid is tough to defend and all these things. It's not like the Oilers, I mean, they, they finished low in the in the standings. They were out of the playoffs for part of the year. They fired their coach. Like, this is not an unbeatable team. This is a team that's very beatable if you play them the way they need to be played. Yep. And that's where you have to be actually focused and paying attention to details, not making line changes when the other team has the puck. You know, just simple, basic 101 level defensive structure, you know, and like it's just bad, frankly, that like they're getting run around like this. Like the Flames are better than this, and they should be playing better than this, but they're just too ramped up and amped up and like they just need to reset themselves realize that they're playing an inferior opponent and just play their game like well and i think even if we take out the inferior opponent part just play your game like don't worry about who your opponent is just play the way that you played all season to have success well and by that i mean like what you're doing if you're doing things right you should be able to beat them. It's not like Ottinger where you're throwing everything in the kitchen sink and am I actually going to beat this guy? It's like if you're do it, methodically doing what you're supposed to do, you should be able to win games. And like this, this team is just getting in their own way. Yeah, and yeah, getting in their own way and not not doing what made them successful, not doing what got them to where they are. No, and like if they were, it would be two one or three nothing for us in this series. But it's how would you say like, and like this has been characteristic of this team for years, like all the way back to the Colorado series, is just the lack of mental maturity from this organization. And it, like, you know, like it's one of those things where, like, yeah, years that happens, but you know, it's been like four years since we played the Avalanche, like. You should be, you know, good to go now. Like, Is it fair to say the best line for the Flames in this series has been the second line of Backlund, Mangiapane, and Coleman? Um, either that or the Lucic, Lewis, and Richie line. Yeah, I'd say, I, I would say that the second line, I think, has given us more on both sides of the ice. I agree. I just, how would you say it? They've been doing a really good job, the fourth line. So uh, they need a good shout out too, because you know they're one of the few lines that have actually been like momentum shifters in this one. So yeah, and isn't that kind of weird that I mean, you know, one of the lines that has the most goals is the Lucic line. Like that's the line we kind of expect the least production out of. Yeah, well, the other guys have to step it up. Yeah, and, and you know we talked about this uh, in the Dallas series as well, and I think it's holding true here. The Flames also have to be more successful in the faceoff dot. Yeah, I know, like especially uh, especially against McDavid. I think the biggest way to beat him is just control the puck, so he can't. Yeah, exactly. The more you're you've got the puck, the less that you know you can get abused by him. So, it, but. Yeah, it, it's just a lot of lack of mental discipline from this team. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, and I, I hate to keep harping on it, but like it, it's like every period, it's like the same story over and over and over and over again. And it's like, 
Come on, guys. And, you know, you mentioned the mental maturity of this team, and I think that Game 4 is really going to show us what the Flames have internally, inside their heads, because we're going to see, can this team... They know how to do this. This isn't like we're asking them to go to a level they've never been at or rarely been at. We're just asking them to get back to their baseline. Can they realize this is do or die, and can they pull out whatever they need to pull out to play the way they need to? Yep, and if they can't, that's fine. That will also have knowledge of them, and you know, like how would you say it? it's one of those things where young players need to grow and mature, at, especially in the postseason. It's just that you don't have a long time to learn these lessons. Like if you're actually wanting to remain in the postseason, like you, it's like okay, yeah, the first three thing games have been really bad from a mental maturity standpoint, you got to get going in game four or your season's done. Like, you know, and then you, your slate's clean. If you actually win game four, first four games don't matter. Go out and win two out of three. But, you know, if you're not willing to be able to reset or actually able to reset, Things can spiral really quickly, and yeah. And even when I look at this team, though, there's not a lot of guys I would... I mean, maybe guys without a lot of playoff experience, but not a lot of guys I look at as young players in the league. I mean, when we look at the top line, Goudreau, Lindholm, they've been around for a while. Yeah. Kachuk may be a younger player. Second line, Manjipani, I'd say a younger player, but Backlund and Coleman, lots of NHL experience. Yep. Yarn Croak has playoff experience. Foley playoff experience. Dubé doesn't. Lucic, Lewis both have experience like this is a an experienced playoff team so i think that that whole you know young players argument only goes so far as well well how would you say it's also difficult when the guys like say backland uh even yarn karak um like they, they gudro uh, lindholm like none of those players have a lot of playoff experience you know like yeah they're in terms of calendar age yeah they're older than like rookies but you know, like up until literally the series against Dallas, like they had never faced adversity in the playoffs and actually steeled themselves away to win the series. That's true. You know, like that's literally the first time since 0304 that any Calgary Flames team has actually faced adversity and been able to actually pull it off. That's fair. It, you know, it's one of those where this team needs to be like, okay, and then reset and learn those lessons. And Daryl is very good, and again, this is why I really wanted Daryl is for situations like this, because if anybody's going to be able to get them to reset and get back on their path, it'll be him. It's just, you know, it's always unfortunate when this team... It seems to like instead of just taking the easy route has to like find all of the difficult routes first and find that oh we're we're not successful before looping around to doing the things that should just come natural to them you know obviously somebody said something in the dressing room um between the second and third period of game three yeah at least one guy we know the flames don't have a uh, and, and this will kind of come back to what you're just saying, but we know that the Flames don't have a captain this year. And and we've talked a little bit about, you know, why that might be, who who those leaders are. But like you said, they're taking a long way to do anything. I wonder if, or taking the long road to do anything, maybe is a better way of saying it. I wonder if this playoff series, maybe more off the ice than on the ice, is going to really show who the real leader is and who will emerge as captain next year. If there's that one guy that's getting them fired up and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, maybe this is the time for the team to really say, who is it that is our captain? Yeah. And to be determined. Yeah. And we may not see that. We may never know until that guy gets the C on their Jersey. Um, but you know, this might be the time the coaches are seeing, wow, so-and-so is going out there and motivating the team or so-and-so is doing, you know, this that, you know, is captain material or has been in the playoffs and gives us that idea. Like, you know, I, I think this is where the leader might be born. 
And, you know, what you're saying about the Flames taking longer or the longer road to doing things, I think part of that is just being a young playoff team and not having a lot of playoff experience, like you said, that they don't always know the best way and you have to make mistakes to learn. Yep. So I just think that's probably a big part of what's going on here. Um, we'll, we'll do our game recap or we'll, or we'll do our predictions in a little bit and talk about games four and five. Um, but why don't we, why don't we focus on something a little bit different in the flames world? Shall we? Yep. Um, trophy talk. Let's start there. Two more flames announced for trophies this year. And I don't think either of these are surprising to us. Uh, Lindholm has been nominated for the Selkie trophy. And I'll just read the Selkie trophy award. The Frank J. Selkie trophy is the annual award given to the forward who best excels in the defensive aspects of the game. Um, I think, I don't know if he'll win that one, but I think, a very deserving nomination. I think this is the year that the league probably finally took notice of um, Elias Lindholm. Yeah. Well, with the forward group uh, on his line, having like the best plus minus season in like 30 years plus that. Yeah. So I, do you think he's got a plausible shot of winning that? Uh, it's the Patrice Bergeron award this year. That's kind of what I'm thinking too. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Like if it's not Bergeron, it's Lindholm. But I I don't see anybody but Bergy winning it. I agree. But the the next trophy might be different. No surprise, Daryl Sutter nominated for the Jack Adams Award for Coach of the Year. Uh, the coach nominated to be most uh, most influential in their team's success. Surprisingly, Daryl's never won this award. Andrew Brunette of the Florida Panthers and Gerard Gallant of the New York Rangers, the other two finalists. And Matt, I think, you know, if for no other reason, then he's never won it. And that's been made a big deal. The other two guys, younger guys will have a chance again. I think this is probably Daryl's. Yeah, I, I think that you could have inscribed his name on the trophy back in January. <laughs> so, and nothing has changed since then to No, And as you and I have talked about, it's, you know, it's the coach who's most influential in their team's success. That's the definition of the award. I don't think we can look at Burnett or Gallant and say that them specifically had such an impact on the Panthers or the Rangers. I think those were good teams that you could insert kind of one of the 35 yeah. NHL coaches that, you know, sort of ride the carousel and you would have been fine. Yeah, pretty much. Like uh, the Rangers, like the bulk of their turnaround was just Durkin being amazing, which, you know, like they were, they are and were in a rebuild um and up as close as like last season and you know the goalie just became amazing so you know and that will win you a lot of games so mm -hmm. um like even as a team the rangers are kind of still on the weak side of things up in front of uh Shesterkin, but you know, uh, one of those where, you know, the Rangers' success is largely due to the goaltending and not so much the coaching staff. And, you know, Florida is the best team in the NHL, but I think that it's one of those situations where uh, if you put anybody, you know, a fan on the street, I think that that team still would have been, like, the best or second best team in the NHL. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, especially from a team that didn't make the playoffs last year to where they are now, we have to credit so much of that to Daryl. Yeah, especially considering, like, as a team, like, if you're just looking at rosters on paper, like, the Flames are actually slightly worse this year than they were last year, uh, largely due to Giordano leaving. And, you know, yet, like, they had a significant improvement in their point totals, which... You know, and so many of their players having career highs, and that's entirely the coach. I would agree. So I think I would – let's just say that while I agree with you about the Selkie that's probably Bergeron, I'd be surprised if anybody but Daryl wins Jack Yeah, Adams. I, I would be blown away if – and you know, and be going like, why? And I'm honestly surprised that he's never won it before. Uh, when I saw that stat, I yeah. was I was surprised by that. Well, it took Martin Brodeur until he was like thirty four or thirty five to win the Vesna. So, you know, it it's not completely out of the realm. It's just. But how many cups did Brodeur have? Like, I think if you look at you know successful teams Daryl's been with, 
I, I'm just surprised it's taking them that long. Yeah. Um, and then the last piece of, I guess, Flames adjacent news. It's official now that the AHL Stockton Heat will be relocating to Calgary. And that was rumored for a while. It's been made official this week. Um, actually, I think today, as of Monday, when we're recording this, it's been made official. So interesting there that the Flames will now own three hockey teams playing in the city. The Calgary Flames, the Calgary Heat, for lack of a better term, and the Calgary Hitmen. And we saw this working, I mean, we saw this during the pandemic when the Stockton Heat played in Calgary, and I think that's where the team realized, you know what, that was nice to have those guys close and be able to see them, maybe we want to look into this. Also, a crowded Pacific division with um, the new Coachella Valley team coming in the Pacific, I can see why maybe the league was more okay with moving a team north. Remember the Flames used to have a team in Adirondack, or sorry, in um, Abbotsford, and that didn't work. I was thinking about Adirondack and Stockton, but yeah, they had the team in Abbotsford, didn't work as a travel. Now with the team there, gives you another regional rival. But I think for me, the question is, what does this look like? And we won't know, so purely speculation, what does this look like building-wise? Do you think we'll have the AHL and the NHL team out of the Dome? Yeah, uh, I would assume so. And uh, the Hitmen will probably play some of their games in the Sal Dome and probably in the Sutina um, Nations Seven uh, Chiefs arena. Sportsplex? Yeah. Couldn't think of the name off the top of my head, so thanks for... You know, it's and, and we are talking about this a little bit before the show, it's so centrally located. I mean, it's not a great venue, especially when you think about NHL and AHL and all the off-ice facilities they need as well. There's more than just a nice surface. I wonder if there would be any desire, probably not because they're looking to build a new building, but to putting some money into Max Bell. I think it's more central for families if they're going to, say, WHL game than Sutina Nation is. I think it's you know better transit access, which I know has been important for the Flames City in the past. Not the best venue inside, but I would, I would think that that would probably be the better venue than... I mean, you and I have been to Windsport. It's hard to get to. Parking's not great. I don't think people want to haul their kids up there for you know hitman games but max bell seems like it'd be the perfect location yeah i agree um it i think uh, just due to like the amount of games that need to be played that i'm sure that you could probably get away with most of the games being played in the saddle dome for all three teams it's just that uh it'll be a little bit more difficult uh not necessarily impossible to have like all of the games uh, for all three, but it'll take some interesting uh, leapfrogging around, especially like on the weekends, for because that's where the AHL plays most of their games to make sure that everything is set properly. I'm really interested to see as well how this changes the hockey market in the city. I mean, I know a lot of families that go to Hitman games because. They're affordable. It's a good family show, that sort of thing. And I think that there's a lot of fans in the city who aren't going to the Flames because the Flames are expensive. And it, you, by the time you put in parking and tickets and food and all the things, especially as a family, um, it's you know it, it's an expensive night out. But I, if you can see almost NHL quality um, hockey in the AHL at a fraction of the price, I can see there being a lot of people very interested in AHL season tickets or AHL tickets in general. Well, especially because Stockton's doing so good because of a whole bunch of the good young players that are in the organization. So it's like you get to see how amazing Dustin Wolf is before he's actually in the NHL. And, you know, he will be a good NHL goaltender. So it's like, oh, hey, cool. You get an awesome preview of that. And, like, that'd be mm -hmm. worth the price of admission just for that. Yeah. And, you know, again, I can see people that want to go to Flames games instead of hitting up the AHL team and seeing. There's going to be a jump between the Hitmen and Stockton for sure. I'd say there's going to be a lesser jump between, let's call them the Calgary Heat and the Calgary Flames. Yeah. Still some jump, but um, you know, you're know you seeing very high-level pro. For sure. And like the AHL is pretty much the second best uh, league in the, in the world for hockey. So, you know, it's like right there for... Uh, and the value for dollar is significantly better. I don't think we'll see it anytime soon, but it does make me wonder if the Hitmen will be short for this city. Could very well if be. In five, six years, they have to be relocated. I mean, I don't know where you put them, um, and that wouldn't be the Flames' problem at that point. They'd probably be selling them, but 
Um, yeah, I, I could see. I just don't know that there's enough ticket dollars in the city for three pro teams. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it'll it'll be fun to see. I'm expecting the hit or the heat to get. Well, obviously they're going to get a new logo. I'm hoping it's going to be less Safeway like. You and I have talked about how their S looks like Safeway, and I'm hoping they'll get a more updated color scheme as well to reflect the flames. I mean, they're still wearing the old blue jerseys with the piping on the arms. I think you'll see those two teams a lot more in lockstep in terms of uniforms, branding, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, and I'm just hopeful that, you know, like, uh, even if they wanted to do something else, like uh, go with, like, uh, like the Calgary Wranglers or Cowboys or some other team that, like, Calgary has had in the past uh, to keep it Calgary-centric instead of Flame-centric, that could also be a different venue to go down as well. Lots of different options, though. I would rather not use the Cowboys name. I think that's very much sort of tourist, you know, um, what do you call it? Maybe tourist-centric or, you know, tourist... um, I'm not arguing with you there. Stereotypical. I wouldn't be... I don't think the Wranglers would be bad, but um, I would like them to keep the fire-like name, whether it's the Heat or the Scorch or, you know, the... I guess you can't... You couldn't have the Baby Flames. Like, when we were in Saint San Jose, we... Or St. Uh, John, sorry. We had the St. John Flames. You couldn't have the Calgary Flames and the Calgary Flames. Well, you could. Um, it would just be confusing. It, it's just like uh, Toronto used to have the Toronto Maple Leafs baseball team at the same time that there was the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team. But two different sports, at least. If you're saying, oh, I'm going to the Saddle Dome to see the Calgary Flames play... Yeah. Um, so I, I would I would be surprised if they didn't keep it sort of quote unquote in the family, sort of that heat yep. you know, name. What was the Abbotsford team's name? The Abbotsford Heat? Yeah. Yeah. And then we had we had some Flames teams in there. I think we had the uh we had the Omaha Arksaban Knights, which was very different. We had the Quad City Flames, the Adirondack Flames, the Utica Devils. So, yeah, I mean, they've always tried to keep it sort of heat, flame. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think they'll do the same here. And, you know, I guess my question on this, too, and we will only know as things unfold, is this ownership looking at Calgary as being a, you know, a long-term destination? Or is this a, we need to get out of Stockton. Let's just put them there till we find somewhere else. Uh, I think it's more of a long-term thing instead of a short-term thing. But... You know, the AHL is so fungible that it's kind of hard to tell really more than like two or three years out. Yeah, and and I think that they will see a ton of cost savings bringing it in-house too. I mean, if you look at the Flames and the Hitmen, a lot of the same media teams and ticket teams and that sort of thing sell for both. So those teams will just continue to work with this new property. Like, I think there's going to be a huge... Uh, cost savings there and unfortunately probably a lot of people losing their job in Stockton but a huge cost savings that will make it even more lucrative to keep them in and around Calgary yeah well plus like if you're having like the same facilities and all that like you say like you got like all the treadmills and other exercise equipment in the gym well you know you if you're only having one of those for everybody you know, like mm-hmm. that saves one set of costs, you know, like the trainers just need to be there generally. So like, it, you know, it, it, a lot of, because of the amount of overlap, like it, it helps to keep costs down, um, which travel costs go up, but I think that'll be buoyed by, you know, keeping the team closer together having the young players being able to practice, not necessarily with the Flames, but, like, right there with the coaching staff. They can go see the Flames practice. You know, and... And and I think a lot more community engagement pieces, too. Like, we've even seen the... We didn't see it in the last couple of years, but the old Danon skills competition. I could almost see it being NHL versus AHL at that point. Yeah. Um... You know, I, I just think that there, you'll see more of those guys in the community. F- Flames fans will get to know those players a little bit better. And, and I think it'll just work well for everybody um, to have them here. I think the Flames realized that during COVID when Stockton played out of the Saddle Dome. And also, I mean, you can't get quicker recalls than that when you're at home. Yeah, it's like, hey, drive down the street to our Saddle Dome, thanks. Well, not even that. If they're playing together, just well, walk down the hall. I know. It's like, you know... Oh, you're at lunch. Well, come back. 
you know, you'll be go taking a left instead of a right type of thing. And you know, I think you said it well as well earlier. It's you know, rubbing shoulders with the NHL guys, even if you're not on the ice with them, being able to watch them, being able to talk to them, being able to sort of let that NHL rub off on you is going to be important as well. Yep. And it gives the the players there something tangible to shoot for because they, they'll they know, like, okay, this is what I have to do to get better to make the NHL, and, 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 and. And I think also for the coaching and management staff of the Calgary Flames, much better looks and access at their prospects. Well, plus, like, say you have a guy like Gaudreau uh, doing his off-ice training and such. And, like, you're watching him across the gym and you're seeing, like, how much he's putting in to do the various things for his strength training. And you're a guy like, say, like Matthew Phillips, you can look across saying, okay, well, that's what I need to do in order to be successful at the NHL level. And, you know, like, ramp up your regimen or whatnot accordingly. Yeah, I think that's definitely one one thing that it brings for sure that could be good. Well, Matt, I think that brings us to the next week for the Flames. Yep. Um, we have two games this week. Game four, well, game that, five. No, oh, I'm going to correct you. That's right. We have three games this three week. Three games. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're right. I just, I wasn't, I, I was looking, I just for some reason thought I was one day ahead in the schedule. So yep. you're right. There's three games this week. Game four, game five, game six. I, I thought it was the 25th, not the 23rd for some reason. I was looking at the schedule, so that's just my bad. Yep. Um, but, yeah, three games this week potentially um, could be – well, no, I guess they have to play all three. Yeah. Well, assuming the Flames no, they don't. one. Yeah. That's right. No, they, they only have to play two. But, yeah, there's three games in the docket. Game four tomorrow night, which is the 24th in Edmonton, 7.30 start time. Game, game five is in Calgary, back here, and that will be on the 25th. Game five starts 7.30. The red lot is open again after the wind issues, and you can get free tickets to that. Uh, they're available at the Calgary Flames website. And then the 28th, which will be Saturday night, that is game six at Edmonton, time to be determined. So three games in the docket this week, Matt. Neither of us did great last week. What do you think for this week? Well, I'm going to be negative Nelly again because of the fact that, you know, it worked last time and say loss, loss. So you think you think loss, loss, and then they're out. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that, like, this team needs to show. And, you know, like, words are fine. And, you know, saying, like, you have to be better in this and that and whatever. They have to go out and show it. Like, it, it it's literally put it up time. And, you know, uh, this team, like... Last round, I was frankly surprised that they were able to turn it up to the extent that they did to the point where they actually won the series um, because that's literally the first time that this group has even been able to do that. And, okay, you're down in the exact same spot that you were last time. You got to show it. And, you know, they haven't with any consistency, so I'm going to go with that as my predictions and... Yeah, you know, hope that I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna go a little bit of a a more pessimist or a more optimistic than you're pessimistic. Um, I'm gonna go with win win loss. And then the Flames will win game four in Edmonton, and then they'll win game five in Calgary to be three two. Then then they'll lose on the twenty eighth to force game seven. Not that I want game seven. I mean, you know, game seven was stressful last round. Yeah. But I think that's where we may end up getting to. So basically, you and I are predicting the exact same way that we did last time. And, you know, it would be interesting if the series basically ended up being the exact same as last time. It's hockey superstition, right? Yeah. I mean, we talked last week about the listener who said that he's messaging us every game because when he doesn't, they lose. We got to predict the same every game because when we don't, they lose. Yep. Well, so, hopefully... You know, like I'm always hopeful that this team, you know, and like I always have been hopeful that this team, because the talent level they have, they should be able to be like they're equally as good as Tampa Bay, Colorado, St. Louis, Carolina. Like they're e they're an equal of those teams, but they have to show it and. But, you know, that's literally up to them. 
We'll see if they can come out and do it. I think that winning game four is critical. If they lose game oh, yeah. four, I think that they're done. Yeah, same here. So they, they need to get the big win in game four to at least tie things up. And from there, they have a chance to win it. But if they can't even do that, I think we're having a very different discussion next week. Yeah. And if they lose this series to the Oilers, I will be mocking them in perpetuity. Because you lost to the Oilers in the playoffs. Well, I may have to find another co-host then, man. <laughs> if this is going to become the let let's mock the the flames of perpetuity, we might have to get your own Oilers spinoff show. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's leave things there. We don't have a playoff anthem this week. Um, we're talking to a couple people who are working on some or have them out there just to get rights clearance and that sort of thing. But we will. It doesn't feel like the right week for a playoff anthem, anyways. Um, so we will hopefully be back with one next week when the Flames start winning or, yeah, winning some more games. Well, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.